question in the homework. There's a little question, and we didn't do it in class because uh, it was quite easy. What is the LCM? Very good. But we are not going to, as a GCD, we're not going to define it as least anything. We're going to say that is the union of common <coughs> primes with the highest <coughs> exponent. Union of primes. So how does that work if 48 is 2 to the 4 times 3 and 60 is 2 to the 2 times 3 times 5? Remember how the GCD went? The GCD of those two things was the common primes. So how many 2's are in common? 2. How many 3's are in common? And how many 5's are in common? Zero. How about the LCM? How many tools do I need to take as a union, the, the maximum number of tools? Four. Four. So highest exponent. The GCD was lowest exponent. How many twos do I, threes do I have to take? One. And I have to take a five, right? Because there's a five there, and I have to take it. I'm sure you guys figured this out for the homework. What I want to point out is that if I make the product 48 times 60, that was a question in one of the recitations, I think. I can think in the same way, like I think of GCD and LCM. And I say, how many tools do I need in the product now? When I make a product, I take two and four, right? So how many tools I'm gonna have there? Six. How many threes I'm gonna have there? Two. And how many fives I'm gonna have there? One. What I would like to point out is that this exponent in the GCD is the mean between the exponent in A and the exponent in B. In, in the case of two, that's the minimum between the two exponents, two and four. Right. Again, in a GCD, I look at the exponents for the two. Each prime number is separate. So I took a prime number two, the exponents are two and four, I take the minimum. Who's this four? Between the two exponents, 2 to the 4 and 2 to the 2, this 4 is the maximum, which is the maximum between 2 and 4. In this case, for the prime 2. How about in the product? Who's this exponent, this 6? In the product. You know, I'm working on the tools, but it's the same story with threes and fives and whatever other primes I have. How can I write this six? So. Six is the sum between the exponent in A and the exponent in B, which is two plus four. <coughs> so in the GCD, the exponent is the minimum. In the LCM, the exponent is the maximum. In the product, the exponent is the sum. If you remember from like secondary school, the minimum between two numbers plus the maximum between two numbers is actually the sum of the two numbers. Right? If I take between two numbers the minimum of them plus the maximum of them, I'm effectively summing them up. Which means that the two plus the four will be the six which means that the product <coughs> is gonna be the GCD times the LCM. Because when I multiply things, the exponents add up. So if I <coughs> multiply the GCD times LCM, I'm gonna get the same thing as I'm multiplying A times B. 
this lemma is in the note somewhere. I thought I pointed it out because while the LCM is an obvious thing, this lemma might not be. All right. In particular, if GCD is one, how much is the LCM of two numbers? Is the product, right? And uh, if GCD is A, like say A is a factor of B, then the GCD between A and B will be A. How much is the product then? How much is the LCM? B, right? So that's a useful formula sometimes to do calculations with it. So what we really have to do today is to move on. But before we move on, we want to finish something with RSA. Or take for 10 minutes. So we say RSA uh, steps. I, I'm going to focus on one step. If you remember when we start the setup RSA, I should say setup, because I'm not talking about um, I'm not talking about how to do encryptions and decryptions. I'm talking about how to set it up. Remember what was the first step in RSA? The first thing I do. Pick two primes, right? So choose, I should say that's step one. Uh, choose two primes. We have to be large. Uh, P and Q, right? So today I only want to talk about this one step, not the rest of RSA. How do I do that? How can I pick a large prime number? Remember that the whole RSA uh, thingy, factorization, is hard for large numbers. This is essential to have a cryptographic system in this case that is hard to break. So if somebody says, pick a large number and factorize it to see if it's prime or not, right? That, that would be a decent strategy. That's not gonna work because the whole point of RSA is that factorization is hard. So how do I pick a large prime number? We talked about this at, at the recitation for a little bit, there were one or two exercises there. And the strategy is, how to choose a large prime number. There are two steps. Pick a large <coughs> random number. By large, I mean about 600 digits in base 10, which is equivalent to 2,048 bits. So these are really large numbers. They're not 10. A trillion is 10 to what? A trillion is? That's a billion, right? 12, 10 to the 12. So how many digits in base 10 a trillion has? 12. Well, I'm talking about much larger numbers than a trillion, okay? Because how many digits will this have? 600 digits, okay? It's way bigger than trillions and all the numbers we, we can, we, we normally talk about. So pick a large random number of that many digits and to verify if it's prime. Primality. So we need to use a primality <laughs> test. Again, this is not, cannot be the same as factorization. If we attempt to factorize a large number, that's hard. That's the whole point of RSA. We cannot simply say, okay, factorize it to check if it's prime, um, because factorization is not possible efficiently on such big numbers. So for this, we use the converse <coughs> of Fermat's theorem. <coughs> um, 
which says if for any A between 1 and P minus 1, um, <coughs> A at P minus 1 is 1 modulo P, that implies P is prime. That's a converse. I, I think I've already put on the board the Fermat's theorem, which the Fermat's theorem is the exact opposite, right? This is premise, conclusion. The Fermat's theorem was the exact opposite. If P is prime, then for any A except zero, as a reminder, these are all reminders except zero, then A at P minus one is one modulo P. And we know this is true because this is a simple particular case of Euler's theorem. Euler's theorem for reference, I hope you remember it, A of P of N is one modulo N if the GCD of A and N is one. So this is a particular case of Euler's theorem, read this way, but not that way. That way is the converse of it, and it's not always true. So as a primality test, may fail us. May say, okay, if you check all the A's and you get one, uh, then P is prime. Of course, we cannot check all the A's if P is that big. <coughs> we have to check some A's. So we take a sample of five A's, 10 A's, 20 A's, 50 A's, so on and so forth. And if all of them come up one, then we say, okay, we start believing that P is a prime number. So again, uh, as a primality test, so that is not always true. But often enough, that we don't bother with the mistakes it makes. So in practice, how does it take? Choose a sample of A's. <coughs> How many A's depends how much time and computation I have. Check if A at P minus one is one mod P for all this, let's call it sample here. For all A's in the sample, if yes, say P is prime. Again, not always true, but it's true 99.99% of the cases, so we use it as a primary test. Yes? Um, is there selecting a random prime, uh, random number and seeing if it's prime? Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to compute like all the prime numbers in like, a certain range and then randomly choose from that prime? It would make sense, uh, but we can't do it. Computationally, it's too hard. You can go to the prime numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, where they're small, and people have gone up to 10 to the 22. So they figure out all the primes up to 22 digits long, which are more than what we normally talk. Any quantity that we talk in real terms, you know, like uh, how many TVs do I have to buy from Japan? We're never gonna hit numbers that big, 10 to the 22, right? But 10 to the 22 is too small for what we need. Going further than 10 to the 22 and checking primality would be very inefficient to, to do it that way. So for small primes, we all know the sequence of initial primes up to the 10 to the 22, and those can be looked up. Those are not the numbers used for cryptography. They're too small. They only have 22 digits. We need numbers that have 600 digits, and we cannot simply enumerate the primes up to that high value. Now, well, this works in practice. By the way, th there are better tests. So uh, there's some better in practice. Uh, RSA, better tests <coughs> for primality than per month. We do this one in class 
because it's a nice example of number theory, but there are better tests. Still not 100% accurate, but still better than, than Fermat's theorem converse. If you really work for RSA, you wouldn't use this test, you'd use a better one. What I want to talk about today before we move on to sets and counting is how can this theorem fail? Why does it fail? Why the converse of Fermat? Fermat is not true. This is a theoretical argument. For RSA in practice, it won't matter. Even if it's not true, it's true so often that I can still use it and get by every once in a while. I'm going to use a prime that's not really a prime number, but it's so rare that it's going to be fine. Theoretically speaking, though, mathematical point of view, how can this fail? What do I need for it to fail? I'm going to take an n that on one side I need for every a that has the GCD of a and n equal 1, I need to have a to the n minus 1 equal 1 modulo n. So n, uh, n is the kind of proper example. So that needs to happen. That, that's the premise of the, the converse, right? But on the other side, I need n to not be prime. Right? That, that would be the case when this primality test is failing, when it's not true. It checks out for all, all a's that you can pick that you get a 1. So like the premise is asking. <laughs> But the number is not prime. <coughs> so how can this happen? Well, if the number is one, it's always going to happen. Right, we're not talking about numbers as small as one. Yes. Who's prime with who? Uh, a is relatively prime with n. Yeah, but that has to be for every a. Right? So it's not just for one a. So I, I'm interested in what properties mathematically do we need to have here? for this to fail, meaning both those things are true. So I'm saying here, and. <laughs> because the theorem is saying, the, the primality test is saying, if this happens, then n is a prime. We know it's not true all the time. I'm asking when it's not true, when this thing ends up being not a prime number. So for that, I'm going to say, um, we know that, so now I'm going to say, uh, how, how do I think about this? We know that A, a phi of N, is 1 modulo N. That's Euler's theorem. And we want A at N minus 1 to be N modulo N. Right? To be 1 modulo N. So we, we have to play with those conditions and with the fact that N is not prime to see what kind of ends are suitable for this setup here. So n is not prime, I'm going to say, OK, it has a prime decomposition, p1 at e1 times p2 at e2 times pt at et is the prime decomposition. And now, um, what I would like is to choose a little a. So I'm just looking at this factor here. Choose an a1 such that um, a1 at p of p1 a1 equal 1 mod p1. So I know A1 has an order, order of A1 in Z, P1, E1. This order has to divide P of P1, E1. Um, if it's easier to think in terms of an example, think of this as being 3 to the 5th times 7 to the 3rd times 11 to the 4th. What I did, I took the 3 to the 5th 
and I say, I want to find an element in there that has the order phi of that value. So 3 to the fifth is 243. What I'm asking here, I want a remainder modulo 243 such that the order, we know that the phi of 243 from last time it's got to be, I don't know if you guys remember, is 3 at the previous power times 3 minus 1. Remember that? Was p at the previous power? That was in the homework too. So we know that, and in here we know the order must divide this phi of 243. We, we did that for about two weeks and a half now. Whatever remainder is there, uh, if it's co-prime, of course. The GCD of A1 and 243 has to be a 1. We know the order has to divide that, but we want a little further. We want the order <coughs> of A1 to be exactly the P value. So you know when we did the things with the orders and we say, if the order is 60, the, the phi of n is 60. What are the possible orders? The possible orders are the dividers of 60. 2, 3, 5, 12, so on and so forth. In here, while we know that, we want a little extra. We want to find a value for which the order is not just the divider of 60, or in this case, it's uh, 81 times 2, 162. We want the order to be exactly that value. This is a theorem. The fact that we can find such a <coughs> such a, a one, it's a theorem that we cannot prove today. We just don't know enough mathematics, but we'll be able to prove it before the term is over. We need a proof technique that's called induction. And when we study that two months from now, we're gonna make this proof. That again, <coughs> if n or if my number is three to the fifth. We already know phi to the n is 3 to the 4th times 3 minus 1. We know everybody has an order, and we know all the orders divide phi of n. The question is, can we find somebody whose order is exactly phi of 243? By the way, I think this is 162 because it's 81 times 2. That's always possible when n has this form, 3 to the 5th. But we can't prove that theorem today. We'll prove it before the term is over. So since we, we found this, uh, the order of A1 to be exactly phi of P1 at P1, what happens, the order is the smallest value at which I get 1. Right? That's the order. So now, because of this, uh, actually, maybe we don't need this. We need the hypothesis. Because A1, this value that I found at n minus 1, is also 1, that's written here. That means the order of A1 has to be a divisor of n minus 1, which means this uh, phi of P1 e at E1 has to divide n minus 1, which means we know from last time what is phi of this value. That is P at E1 minus 1, previous power, times P minus 1 has to divide n minus 1. Again, what I do here, I have a, an A that has this order. And I, the hypothesis, the premise of the theorem is telling me that at n minus 1 is a 1. But the only time you get the power that gives you 1 is if you are on a multiple of the order. The order is the smallest value at which you get 1. So if you keep building those powers, any other power that will give you 1 has to be a multiple of the order, just like P of n is. How many people with me? Okay. Now, if the order I pick is exactly phi of p, uh, phi of phi of one at e one, 
then that phi, which we know from last time the formula, must divide n minus 1. So there's two implications from here. First of all, this whole P1 at E minus 1, E1 minus 1 has to be 0. There can be previous powers of P1. That's very easy to see. P1 divides n, right? How can P1 divide n and n minus 1? Is there any prime number that divides n and n minus 1? No, right? can't divide n and n minus 1. If you do that, you got to be 1. It's not allowed for prime numbers to be 1. The only explanation is that this whole power here is actually a non-existing factor. It's a 1, which means that E1 has to be 1, which means all the primes in n can only appear once. This n cannot be 3 to the fifth. So that's not allowed. n can be 3 times 7 times 11, maybe but it cannot have exponents in it. Let me say this again. If P1 is truly a factor, because we don't know E1 minus 1 is a real exponent or is 0. If P1, got it. So can you open it up and pass it? If P1 has a real exponent here, it means it divides at minus 1, but also divides n, which is impossible. Therefore, this exponent has to be 0. So n has each prime once. It can't have multiple 3's or multiple 7's or multiple 11. Whatever prime is there can only be once. And secondly, it also means p minus 1 must divide n minus 1. Is P1 minus 1 must divide it minus 1. Those are the conditions that make this possible. The two conditions, all the primes in N have to have exponent 1. They can have exponent 2, 3, 4, nothing, just 1. And P1 minus 1 has to divide N minus 1. So, how about an example? If n is 3 times 11 times 17, how much is that? I think that's 561. Is this, is this satisfying the first condition? All exponents of the primes have to be 1? All exponents of the primes are 1? Okay, so first conditions, exponents of primes are 1. Second condition, this has to happen for every prime. It's not just the first one. The way I prove the first one has to have this property, the other ones have to have the same property. So what is that condition for 3, 11, and 17? For 3 is 3 minus 1 must divide 561 minus 1, right? Is that true? 2 divides that? Right. How about for 11? 11 minus 1 must divide 561 minus 1, right? Is that true? How much is 11 minus 1? How much is 561 minus 1? 560. Is 10 dividing 560? How about the last one? 17 minus 1 must divide 561 minus 1. How much is 17 minus 1? 16. How much is 561 minus 1? 560. Is 16 a divisor of 560? It is. So this all checks out means that if you would test primality for the number 561, every single A you pick, when you do A at P minus 1, that is 560, you're going to get 1 modulo 561. So this is a number for which this primality test will tell you it's prime, but obviously it's not prime. So the primality test fails. Fermat.
because it tells you whatever A you pick. We already proved here that if you have these properties, everything we do goes backwards too. If you have those two properties, it's guaranteed that for every A you choose, when you do A at P minus one, you get one. Yet this number is not right. Those numbers have a name. These particular numbers with this property here, they call Carmichael numbers. The smallest such number is 561. And there are many Carmichael numbers, but not that many. If you look at all the sequence of numbers, there are infinitely many, but they become very, very rare. At that size, 600 digits, those are extremely rare. At that size, they're about one in a hundred trillion. So the chance of picking one, verifying primality, primality checks out because this happens, yeah, the minus one is one. And that being a Carmichael number, it's an extremely, extremely rare event. Much more often, the primality test would fail because I don't get the one here, and I abandon that number, I say, okay, I choose a number that's not prime, let's choose another one, and another one. And Actually, this is not a big problem at all for primality numbers because they're so rare, these Carmichael numbers, one in a hundred trillion, nobody's worried about that. A bigger problem is how many numbers do I have to choose before I find one that the primality holds? Because for most numbers, they're not prime. So if they're not prime, it's not, I'm not worried about the, this test failing. I'm worried about this saying it's not prime, so I have to abandon and move to the next one. There is a theorem that said this process is not too bad. You still have to try a lot of numbers before you find the prime, but it doesn't take forever. It takes a few days with a supercomputer to find the prime number. For each, um, for each number, you have to do like n minus one times anyways. Like Here? Yeah. Here you do add power and minus one. So you pick an A, and you raise it at this power, and you see if you get one. Modulo N. This is more than. Now, depends how much computation you have. You won't choose all of them because they're way too many, but people choose like 100 A's, 200 A's, 300 A's, and if all those check up as one, they start saying, okay, I believe that's a prime number. Okay. The, the, nobody's worried about the Carmichael number. That's a pure theoretical result. The worry people have is, okay, I pick a number, it doesn't work because it doesn't give me one for some age. Then I pick a number number, it doesn't work. How many numbers do I have to try before I find one for which this checks out? Uh, and that takes a few days with a supercomputer to find the prime number. In fact, I believe these days, uh, RSA, the company, give money for whoever finds a prime number that big. Because they know the electricity for those computers to work for that day is like $10,000. So if you find a prime and you prove it's big at that range, they give you $10,000 or something like that. But like, um, well, aren't they worried about not choosing enough A's? And, uh... Right, the tests have to work for, I think, 300 A's. There's a probability computation that says if it works for 300 random A's, the chance of being not a prime, it's smaller than such a small value, 0 0.0001, and therefore we believe it's true. We're never gonna know for sure. But it's a question of how much sure you wanna be versus how much computation can you spend on it. Yes? Are there any numbers that are prime, but the test doesn't give one? No, that's Fermat's theorem. Yeah. If it's prime, it will give one for everybody. So the Fermat's theorem, that way it works. If the number's prime, it's guaranteed to give you one for any A you choose. The other way, it only works 99.9999% of the time. Yes? So are you saying that generating a prime where you're like having to guess as you... And then have I'm generating a random number. I'm generating the digit by digit. I said 600 digits. Pick a random digit, three. Pick another random digit, five. Pick another yeah. random digit. So I generate a sequence of 600 digits. But you're saying the process of doing that and basically getting a 600 digit long prime number, that takes a supercomputer, is that what you were yeah. saying? 
So then how does like a normal user's computer generate a private key and a public key? Because doesn't it have to generate those prime numbers? Yeah, uh, that gets into a pseudo randomness and generators and things that are not exactly mathematically like how they're supposed to be. So at some point, people have to figure out the practicality of this. I think that's his point, right? If the theory says I need so big numbers, and if the theory says I need to do this primality test, it comes down to what she's saying. Okay, I can only afford to sample 300 A's. Maybe if you have a bigger computer, you sample 500 A's. Maybe you have a supercomputer, you sample 3,000 A's or 5,000 A's. So the computer power, I can still do it with the phone by not choosing a large sample of A's. It comes down to how many A's can I test here. If I have a small computer, I can only test few A's, and my chance of being correct maybe is 99%. But if I have a lot more A's, like with a bigger computer, my chance of being correct is now 99.9999%. So it's all a matter of confidence versus computation. So I know that a lot of modern processors have RSA specific parts to them to help them do these functions. What part of that do they optimize? Like what, what part of this process do those like those RSA? So I don't think it's a, uh, I'm not sure it's built into the instructions. Maybe it's built in the modern CPUs. There used to be a coprocessor, so to speak, with mathematical function that has some of this stuff. Uh, Cryptography based on RSA, no one's trying to break it. So the, the advantage of this is that even if I choose a smaller sample, nobody's going to try to break RSA by specifically factorizing my end. That, that's a dead end for hackers or for any adversarial attack. A much better attack is to find a way to see the keys because they are not protected correctly like permissions or looking over the shoulder or finding out passwords or, or putting something in a protocol that, that sips out the passwords. Trying to take a number and factorize it or to see maybe because you didn't have a big computer, maybe you didn't try enough A's and maybe you don't have a prime number so I can find the factors. That, that's a dead end attack. No, nobody would bother with such an attack. Now, I, I, I don't have the answer for what you're asking exactly what is in the process. I would say this sampling for testing, it's one place where you can decide how much computation do I want to put in it. Another part is how big the numbers are. I say 2048 bits, maybe for a bank that's necessary, but for my own computer, there's nothing that secret on this computer, right? Maybe I don't use 2000 bits, I use only 500 bits, or you may just a, um, Passwords for Wi Fi, they use 128 bits, which is very weak passwords. Those, those passwords can be broken by brute force attacks today. 128 bits is just too small. Uh, the other part that is going to be optimized into how do I do the exponentiation? All RSA, not just the setup, this is the setup, but the encoding, decoding relies on fast exponentiation. So by doing that fast enough, uh, just like we showed this uh, fast root square that eventually got, the divisions got optimized and people didn't use algorithms. Exponentiation is probably something that needs to happen fast for RSA to work with you. Okay, so this is not undergraduate material <laughs> for anybody who is wondering, okay? These Carmichael numbers are way over the, the what, what uh, this class is. I just thought I'll give you a, a sense of why primary test works this way. Only very recently, I'm talking about three years ago, somebody proved in India that checking if a number is prime 100% accurately, like with no error, it's possible with an efficient algorithm. So until three years ago, we had a lot of primality tests, but none of them was 100% accurate. We knew how to check if a number is prime, but with very inefficient algorithms, like try to factorize or try to generate prime numbers. There's some polynomials that generate prime numbers. None of these things was feasible. All the tests that existed were inaccurate. They were very good in practice, but not 100% accurate. Three years ago, an Indian person figured out a way to show there is a way to test primality 100% accurate in an efficient way. 
Now, the, algor the actual algorithm to be implemented in a computer, that's still a matter of debate today. It's not figured out completely. But there is a proof that mathematically can be done, AKA primality as a problem is a polynomial time algorithm, which means can be implemented efficiently. But that's only three years ago has been proven. So with that, we're ready to uh, move on to our next module, which is sets and counting. Um, so, We've been already talking about sets a lot. And we have this set builder notation that we've been using. And so now we have to do a lot of uh, little definitions and properties that you all have seen before. So this is going to go fast. And this weak recitation is going to be all about recapping sets, notations, properties, and stuff like that. So um, if you felt like this module number two went a little bit too far in terms of mathematical demand, this week is going to feel very good because it's going to feel like fourth grade. All right? So this is a relaxing week for us. Um, and no, you know, I, I, I literally you're gonna laugh at me when I'm gonna say things like, okay, here's a U, and this U is like one, two, three, four, up to ten. Right? Don't laugh at me, please. Uh, and A is included <coughs> in U. Let me say here, included. This sign, this, this. U on the side, that's included, or it's A is a subset. I can say that. I'm going to say A is the even numbers in U. I could say that. And I could enumerate them. What are the even numbers? 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Um, and uh, I can have another subset, B, it's another subset, and I can say um, B also is included in U, and B are the smaller than five, smaller or equal. So if I say that, what would be the numbers in B? Those would be one, two, three, four, and five. Right? Smaller or equal than five. And then I can draw this stuff nicely. You say, okay, here's my U. Right? That's the whole U. Um, so I can get one, three, two, five, four, uh, six, eight, ten, nine, and seven. That is my big set. <coughs> and now, uh, where, where in here is B? B is this chunk, right? That's B. And who is A? A is the even numbers, right? So B is the one, two, three, four, five. A is the 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. So we can do things like um, what's up with the union of A and B? You guys know the sign union. These are all elements that are either in A or in B. Or is the logical or. So what would be the union of A and B? 
what are the elements that in either A, in A or B? That would be one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, and ten. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, and ten. That's the union of the two sets. How about the intersection? <laughs> Those will be all the values that are in A and so that's an or in B. So what are those that are in both sets? Two and four. Two and four. I could also write this in, in, in terms of this is called <coughs> set builder notation. This stuff here, this is called enumeration. When I'm just listing the values. Set builder means I explain a property of a set. I don't list the elements, I say what property they need to have. So in here, for example, I could say these are all the elements in my universe with the property two divides x, right? Because those are even. And I could say those in here are all the elements in my universe with the property these elements are smaller or equal than five. This is the set builder notation. I'm explaining the property of the set versus the enumeration, just list all the elements. Um, what else can I do? I can, uh, since this, see how union has to do with or, that's the logical or, and intersection has to do with and, right? I can come up with a notion that says complement, uh, let's call it not A, sometimes it's even called not A like this, but I don't like this notation it's then confusing with the logical formulas. I think most people use the not a bar. Complement in a universe. This is a very important thing to remember. Union and intersection works with any two sets. We don't need to have a universe. We don't need to know A is part of a big universe for union intersection. For complement, we need a specific universe big set U. So that would be, of course, I'm sure you can guess who's not A. Uh, so A would be, is what's in the universe, right? But not in A, right? So the, the complement are the elements not in the set. So, of course, what are the elements not in set A? If A is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and universe is 1 to 10, what would be the ones that are not in A, but in the universe? 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. Not in the set. For this notion to make sense, not in the set. You've got to be clear what the universe is. If I tell you, here's a set of students. I have here 110 students. What's not in the set? Well, depends what the universe is, right? If the universe is all CS 1800 students this year, it's easy to answer. What's not in the set? If the universe is all students, what? Everyone in the regular section. What if the, u the, the universe is all Northeastern students? That would be a much bigger complement set, right? Because that complement will be all the other 30,000 students that are not in this class. What if the universe is all the people on Earth? That would be a very different complement, right? The complement of this class, if the universe is all the people on Earth, will be the other 7 billion people that are not in this class. So when you talk about complement, you gotta be very clear what is the universe. 
that is not necessary for union and intersection. If I tell you I'm making a union between this class and the, I don't know, algorithms class, we don't need to know what the universe is. It's everybody who's in either this class or that class, whatever the universe. But for complement, universe is necessary. Okay? So this has a name. This is called a Venn diagram. If somebody tells you draw a Venn diagram, it means a circle or some bubble with elements in it. Okay. And uh, many people represent sets this way for visualization purposes. And then they have color. This is blue and that's red maybe. And then what's in the intersection sometimes? It's hashed is the intersection of two sets, right? This in here I can write as A intersect B if I want to, whatever it's in the middle. Um, so this is a finite set. And we can talk about size. Size, which we call size of U, is 10, because there are 10 elements in it. How about the size of A here? How many elements are here? Five. <laughs> How about the size of A intersect B? So see, I got A intersect B here. What's the size of that? Two. How about the set A union B, the size, how much is that? Eight. So for finite sets, we can talk about sizes. How many elements are in there? That's a well-defined notion because the set is finite. However, there are infinite sets. For example, n, the set of natural numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 100, uh, a million, that's 101, then it's 10 to the 6, 10 to the 6 plus 1, then at some point it's 10 to the 12, at some point it's 10 to the 600. Even though those numbers get very big, they never end, right? There's an infinite number of them. And uh, I could have another set, that's Z, that's a set of integers. So I could list those as 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, you know, minus 10 to the, plus 10 to the 12, minus 10 to the 12, so on and so forth. Also an infinite set. I could have more sets that we, we didn't talk about yet. Uh, you guys know this Q set? That's the, this is called natural. This is integers. How is this called? Q. This is the set of fractions. Uh, so that is the set of all A by B with the property, those are integers, and B is not zero. How is this set called? Set of rationals. So how do I get the rational? It's a fraction of two integers. For example, minus 5 divided by 12. That's a rational, right? It's a fraction of two integers. Uh, how about this set? What is this? Real. So how do we define this? What, what, what is the set of real numbers? Anybody knows? How do I say, okay, assuming n, n, well, how do we start with n? This is the ordinal numbers. Uh, they correspond to counts. If you want to count things, like the chickens in the backyard, you need natural numbers, right? Count students in the class, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? The ordinals. So the way we start with sets, with infinite sets, we say that's an intuitive set. It just corresponds to counts. When you count objects, how many things can you have? Then Z has the counts and the negative counts. 
Q has, has Q all the elements in Z? Is any integer also a rational? Why? Why is minus 25 a rational number? Can I write minus 25 as a fraction? Like what? Minus what? Or minus 25 by 1. Right? So any integer, it's a rational. Is any rational an integer? Is this minus 5 by 12 an integer? No. Okay. Good. But we can define Q this way. Once we have Z, we can say make all the fractions you can. That's your rational numbers. How about I? Q. Is the same as Q? Is all real numbers rational? Can you give me an example of a real number that's not a rational? I, I, huh? I, How do you know it's not rational? It goes on forever. How do you know it goes on forever? <laughs> Somebody told you that. <laughs> it does go on forever. What do we mean by go on forever? Can rational numbers go on forever? Yeah, they can. They can be uh, recurring. They can. they can. Rational numbers can go on forever, right? Do we know that? Do we know that? I'm just going to give an example. 117 times decimal dot. 215, 215, 215, 215, 215, 215. Going on forever. Is this a rational number? Can you write it as a fraction? Huh? So we, we're not worried about the integer part, 117. Obviously, that can be written as a rational number. But what about the 0 0.215215215? What is that? How do I get that? Yes. He's saying 215 divided by 999. I don't know if that's true. But you guys should verify this before tomorrow. Is 215 divided by 999 going to give me this kind of thing? Maybe. So the fact that a number keeps going forever doesn't mean it's not rational. We think this is still a rational number. This, for me, when I wrote this, is like this belongs to this set. It's the same as saying this belongs to a set on the other side. Right? So I, I could go right in, belongs to a set, backwards if I need to find a set on this side. So still a rational number. So what makes a number that going on forever, like pi, not rational? When does it go on forever and it's not a rational number? When it doesn't repeat. When it doesn't repeat. So I thought of an exercise for the meter. You, you want to hear it? If you take the square root of 5, we know that's a real number for sure. There is a number that if you multiply with itself, if this is a value x, it means what? x squared is 5. We know that number exists and it's real. But I was thinking to ask you in the midterm to show that x cannot be a rational number. <laughs> Any number that's a fraction of integers, a by b. Any integers you pick a and b, when you square it, you're going to get what? It say, how the proof go? Proof by contradiction. <laughs> Assume x is a and b with a, b integers, right? That's how we start. We say, OK, let's assume this is rational, meaning it's a fraction of two integers. Then 5, which is x squared, has to be, who's x squared? If x is a by b, how do I square this? a squared by b squared. Now what? That's another exercise for you. How do you prove from here that you get the contradiction that a squared by b squared cannot give you 5 for any integers? There's not two integers. If you do a squared by b squared, you get a 5. So the meter might be not for 5, but for 3, or for 7, or for 11. Who knows? 
Um, so that's Q, the set of rational numbers. And there are some numbers that are real, and we know they are there, like pi, or like square root of five, but they are not rationals. Defining this is hard. We, cannot, we don't have enough mathematics to define a set of real numbers. The proper definition of real numbers requires calculus, requires the notion of limits. Without notion of limits, we cannot properly define R. So that's about infinite sets. And I'm going to get back to them uh, in, in, a, in a 10 minutes or so. Um, so we have union, intersection, complement. Uh, we have a little bit more of those operations here. How about um, set difference? That is A minus B. Some people just say A minus B. I'm not picking on it. If you like the minus, the straight minus sign, you can use that as long as it's clear that A and B are sets. Who is A minus B? The element in A that are not in B. So for my example here, who is a minus B. So I have this A. This is my A here. And I have this uh, B. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Who's A minus B? What are the elements in A but not in B? 6, 8, 10. 6, 8, and 10. So this is called set difference. Uh, and uh, I have here noted that this is the same as intersection between A and B's complement. So why is that? Why the set difference is the same as A intersect with B complement? Well, these elements here got to be in A because they are in A. And they have to not be in B. But not being in B means they are where? In B's complement, as long as the universe is clear. Again, for complements, you've got to be very clear what's the universe. So if I have a universe, B complement is like not being in B. So those go a little bit like the logic rules. The way we apply those logic rules, we can manipulate things and get stuff done. We also have one more symmetric difference. That's a little bit like SOAR. A delta B is, how do I write like SOAR? What would be the equivalent of SOAR here? How does SOAR work when SOAR is 1? When it's SOAR 1? Between two things, two Boolean variables, when do I get SOAR 1? Yes. Uh, it's in either one but not both. Either one but not both. So if I want to do that analogy in here, what would be the elements in the symmetric difference? Has to be in the one set but not in the other set. So either they are in A and not in B, right? or They are in B and not in A. What would be my symmetric difference here? Who's in A but not in B? Who's in B but not in A? Okay. 
So I could write this again as what's in A not in B, right? This set. This is this part in A but not in B. And or this or corresponds in set notation to what? Union B not in A. Again, what is it saying? All the elements that are in A and not in B, union with all the elements that are B but not in A. That's just a difference. I could have also write this as all the union, all the elements in A or B, just like the XOR, right? XOR is at least one of them has to be one, but then take out what? What elements, if I look at the union, what elements are not allowed in the set difference? Both. So how do I write that in set notation? Intersect. So union minus intersection. I could have thought of that this difference that way, what's the union of the two sets? The union is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, minus the intersection, which is 2 and 4. Union minus intersection. And the last operation we need here, actually two operations. One is the Cartesian product, which you already did. It's called AXB. So while we call it set product, this is not the product of taking an element from here and multiply with the element from here. That's not what it means. This is a set of pairs. So this set is all the x, y pairs where x is from A and y is from B. And a pair x, y, it's not the same as the pair y, x. So the order in a pair matters. In a set, the order doesn't matter. This set here is the same set as saying 6, 8, 4, 2, 10. In a set, there is no order. It's just a collection of objects. But when I put this parenthesis, the round parenthesis, the order matters. X, Y, not the same as Y, X. We saw this last time when we did the reminders, Chinese reminder theorem. You get the pro product of three sets. So what would be the Cartesian product here between my A and B? What are the pairs? I have to get every element from A times somebody from B, right? So what's the first pair? 2, 1, then what? 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5. That's all the pairs that use this 2 from A. Two paired up with one, two, three, four, five. Now I move to the next element of A, four. And I have four, one, four, two, four, three, four, four, and four, five. And I'm not done. The next element of A is six. So then I'm gonna have six, one, six, two, 6, 3, 6, 4, 6, 5. The next one is 8. 8, 1, 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4, 8, 5. And the last element of A is 10. So 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, 10, 4, 10, 5. I'm putting the square bracket 
that concludes the set. How many pairs are here? Yes, 25. Because I pair all these pants, five pants, with five shirts. And every pant shirt gives me a unique combination. No set can have an element repeated. In a set, <coughs> every element appears exactly once. We cannot have repeated elements in sets. That's a good observation. No repeated elements. As a notation, I could say, when I enumerate a set, I could list the number four three times. But mathematically, conceptually, it's only once part of the set. Now, there is an extended notion which is called multisets, but we're not studying those. In a multiset, I could have an element like a person multiple times. Okay? But in a set, we do not have repeated elements. However, my, my point here is that I have the pair 2, 4, which means what? 2 is coming from A, 4 is coming from B. I also have the pair for 2. In this pair, 4 is coming from A, and 2 is coming from B. Those are not the same pair. Those are distinct elements in the Cartesian set, right? So this pair here and this pair here, they are two different elements, because in a pair, the order matters. So what's the size of A times B as a set? How big is it? Size. We call it size. It's the size of A times the size of B. This times is the normal times multiplicative sign, right? If that's 5, the reason we got 25 is because this is 5 times 5. That's always true. In a Cartesian product, you get how many elements, how many of A's times how many of B's you have, because everybody's a legit combination. I can make Cartesian products of three sets. I could say, who's A times B times C? What are those? Those are triplets. Those are all the X, Y, Z, with X coming from A, B, uh, Y coming from B, and Z coming from C. And the size of how many triplets I get is how many elements I have in A times how many elements I have in B <coughs> times how many elements I have in C. <coughs> That's what we did last time. We had triplets from, I think, Z3 times Z4 times Z5 or something like that. And every triplet was a sequence of three remainders. Oh, OK. Um, there is, a, there is a product rule somewhere here. Actually, this right here, it's called a product rule. But we should write it in, uh, in, in English. What does it mean? So in English. The number of combinations, mathematically sometimes combinations are called tuplets. Tuplets being a generalization of pairs, triplets, quad quadrants, and so on and so forth. You know, tuplets in general. Sequences of, like I say, A, B, C, okay, it's X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z, so on and so forth, <coughs> from pay, uh, sets A, B, C, so on and so forth. How many of things, combinations can I get? Is the product of the sizes. Product of set sizes. This is exactly this property here. It's saying, if you want to obtain ways to dress up, 
or sequences of three things. The number of ways you can choose somebody from A, somebody from B, somebody from C, and make a triplet, it's exactly A times B times C. Sometimes people call this in other parts of the world independent combinations. Independent as in anybody from A goes to anybody from B goes to anybody from C. Like I did this example of this example, if I have three pants and four shirts and two hats, I can dress up in three times four times two ways. Now that's assuming every dressing combination works. Every pant can be put with every shirt and with every hat. That doesn't happen always in reality. Sometimes some pants don't go with some shirt, or, or at least some people try to dress up in a consistent way to not put red pants, or blue shirts, and yellow hats. Right? And if you start excluding combinations, if you say, okay, the red pants and blue shirt and, red and yellow hat is not allowed, then obviously I don't have that many combinations. This is all of them, assuming everybody from A can participate in a combination of somebody from B and of somebody from C. But if some combinations are not allowed, for example, you can have three different colors. You gotta have at least two between pants and shirt and hat. At least two of them have to have the same color. Then we don't get that many combinations. So in a lot of counting problems, there's a restriction. How many ways to dress up such that the pants and the shirt have different colors? How many ways to dress up such that out of the three objects, at least two of them have the same color? That makes it harder to compute because not every combination is allowed. Yeah, I think it's, it's the order matters. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get there next time, the permutation. It's more complicated than that. For now, the order in here matters when we, when we make a tuplet like this or a pair, but if we're in a set, we don't have orders. Okay. So again, a set is out of order all the time. So that's the product rule. rule. And uh, we have another one that is the sum rule. Oh, let's write it here. <laughs> so we have a product rule, and now we have a sum rule. Um, there's two versions of this sum rule, but they mean the same thing. One is to say that if you want the size of the union, that is the size of A, Actually, let's write it like in the book so we don't get confused. Plus the sign of B. Is that true in general? The size of a union is the sum of the two sets? Okay. I don't know what repeater means. Is that true in general? No. Why, why is not true in general? What's the case where it's not true? Yes. Right. Everything that's in common like some element is in here and here, has been counted twice, right? If a student is in this class and the other class, this counts that student twice, but in the union, every element is only once. Right? So as far as counting goes, this is true. I need a property. What do I need to make this valid? I need to say there's no There is no intersection. No intersection. That's the same as saying as the set. What set has the size zero? I said here the size of the intersection zero. There's a name for that set. There's only one set of size zero. How do I write that? A thing? That's a zero with a thingy. A diagonal line. This is called the empty set. And there's only one empty set. There's not multiple empty sets because there's one, this one set with no elements in it. And the size of that set, since there are no elements, is zero. The size of the empty set is zero. 
So the sum rule says if the intersection is void, this is sometimes called the void set. Depending on what part of the world you go, it's empty set, empty intersection, void set. They mean the same thing, a set with no elements. If there's no intersection, then the union have the size of two, <laughs> the two sets added up. Is that true? That the visualization of that is that here's my two sets, A and B. What does it mean to be no intersection? There's nothing in here. This is empty. Right? The intersection is empty. So whatever things are here, plus how many things are here, nothing is being counted twice. I could say how many elements are total in here. Well, it's the ones from this side and the ones from that side. Nothing is counted twice. I would like you to, from now on, not think in terms of what's in the intersection, but rather how many times we count something. How many, if we, if we add up these sets, how many times I count this plus here? Once. If I have a little circle here, when I add up the sets, how many times I count this set, this circle? Twice. So from now on, we're not going to think of the intersection and unions and set differences as is it there or not there, but rather how many times I've counted that thing. Because our purpose here is to do counting. So when we're going to work with these sets, every time we do something with sets, we got to pick an element and we can say how many times I've counted this element. Okay? So there is a general version of this which is what if the intersection may be not void? That's a more general case. What do I have? If I want to write the same equation, the size of the union, how do I fix that problem if I have an intersection? Is I the size of A, now I have some <coughs> circles in the middle here. It's not void anymore. It's A plus B. The problem now is everybody in this intersection has been counted twice, right? Counted twice. So I have to take them out how many times? If I count them twice and I want to count them once, how many times do I have to take them out? Once. So how do I do that? Something like this, right? This, by the way, works in this case too because the intersection is zero, so it's going to give me that formula. That's a particular case of this. What she's asking, what if I have three sets? How does this uh, stuff work if I have three sets? Okay? So let's suppose we have three sets. Set C. So let's say those are uh, little stars. But now I have several sets of interest. So that's for two sets. Um, how about for three sets? How do I do the union? A, union B, union C. That is, I want to compute the size of the union of those three sets. I could start the same. I say everybody who's in A plus everybody who's in B plus everybody who's in C. Right? So now, how many times I counted the stars? Right here. I count them once. How many times I want them to be counted? Once. So stars are okay, right? They counted once, and I want to count them once. So I'm good with that. Hands up, who's with me? This is like, I, I, I hope we remember this is kind of secondary school, beginning of high school type of stuff. Right? So I'm adding up all the elements here, with all the elements here, with all the elements here. This is fine, this is fine, this is fine. What about the elements that are in here? In this, what is this part here? B, A, C. B, intersections. What is this? 
This is B intersect with C, but not just B intersect with C, right? B intersect with C, it's here too. So what is just this, this chunk in here? This is B intersect with C minus A. How about this chunk over here? This is A intersect with B minus C. Right? How many times I've counted those? So I've counted this stuff once, once, once. How about those? Those are counted twice. I count them for B and for C. How about those? Twice, this is A intersect to C minus B. How about those in here? Twice. How about these ones here? Who is this stuff? This triangle is who? So I could say, okay, now who do I have to take down? Uh, those here are counted twice, but I only need to count them once. So how many times I remove them? Once. So I say remove once times who's who's this set in here? A intersect B C minus B. This got this stuff gotta be removed. Once. I also have to take once uh, A intersect B minus C, right? And I also have to take once <coughs> B intersect C minus A. Those are all the elements that have been counted twice, 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 so I remove them once. But I have some elements, this triangle, which has been counted how many times? Three times. So how many times I have to remove those? Remember, I want to get counts of one for everybody. So how many times I have to remove this? Twice remove of A intersect B intersect C. Turns out, I could have thought about it in a different way. This is okay, it's true for counting. I count stuff too many times, twice, remove it once. If I count three times, I remove it twice. Or I could have said, how about I think about it this way? A plus B plus C. I want to remove, I, I don't like those, are too complicated. I want to remove now A intersect B, A intersect C, and B intersect C. Just like I did before, right? In the sets of two. I remove the intersection. So now, what's my situation? Everybody in here has been counted once. The stuff is here is in the C set. How many times has been removed? This this starts. We counted once in C, right? Has it been removed? This stuff in here? No. Hands up who's with me. Okay. How about these these dots? They counted once in A. Do they have they been removed? <coughs> these dots here? No. No. How about this these dots in here? They've been counted twice for B and for C and have been removed how many times? <coughs> Once, where? In B intersect C. How about this, these circles here? What happened with them? Have been counted twice for A and B. Have they been removed? Once. So the counts for those are two minus one is correct. How about this stuff in here? How many times this have been counted so far? Three times. It has been counted three times. And they have been removed how many times? Three times. Do we all see that? That I've added up this intersection so far three, three times when I counted the individual sets. But I also remove it three times when I remove the intersection by two. Because each intersection by two will contain this. When I remove B intersect C, I say cut, remove them once. A intersect C, remove it again. And A intersect B, remove it again. So what's my current count from this object? My current count for this stuff in the middle is zero. Is that correct? No. No. Yeah, I want to get one, right? I want to get one for everybody. So what do I need to do? Add that thing back. 
How many times I add it back? Once. Once. So you can show that this works with any number of sets. Four sets will be add the sets, subtract the intersection of two, add back the intersections of three, then what we'll do what? Remove the intersection of four, then add back the intersection of five, remove the intersection of six. You can show that for any number of sets, this gives you the size of the union. This has a name, it's called inclusion exclusion principle. Or any number of sets. We did it for two sets and for three sets, but we could have it for six sets or eight sets. Um, yes. So this is the, the set with plus minus intersection of two plus intersection of three minus intersection of four sets <coughs> plus intersection of five sets minus intersection of six sets <coughs> so on so forth. Of course these are the sizes. Um, so, as a quick example here, suppose I want to count n being b times q. I want to count the co-primes with n. That count, as we know, is phi of n. And we already have a formula that's been given last week in the homework. In the RSA note, we know that we're supposed to get p minus 1 times q minus 1. How can we do this by counting? We can enumerate Z, P, Q, all the reminders, 0, 1, 2, all the way to P, Q minus 1. That's all the reminders. Now I can enumerate multiples of P. Those would be 0, 2P, 3P, 4P, all the way to the last multiple of P. I think that's P times Q minus 1. Why is that the last multiple of p in this set? This is the multiples of p in z p q. If I go one more multiple, what's the next multiple of p? So this is p times 2, p times 3. Oh, I, 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 I skipped one here, p. The next multiple of p would be p q. That the p q is not in the set. right? The reminders only go to PQ minus 1. So I want the multiples of P, but only in the set. This is the last one, because the next multiple of P would be PQ. It's outside the set. How about the multiples of Q? Those would be 0, Q, 2Q, all the way to last. What's the last multiple of Q in the set? Q times P minus 1, by the same reasoning. The next multiple of Q would be who? PQ, but PQ is not in the reminder set, because N is PQ. So now, I want to compute how many, the phi of N is the number of co-primes, the size of CN. How do I do that? Well, I could say that's the whole set of reminders minus the set of multiples of p, right? So that's the set A, and that's the set B. It's minus A, minus B, right? What is a, how can I get a non-co-prime? 
a non-co prime has to be either a multiple of p or a multiple of q, right? How can anybody not be a co prime if n is p times q? Those are primes. The only way to not be co prime with n is to be either a multiple of p or a multiple of q, right? There's no other common factors that a non co prime can have. Hands up who's with me. So how do I do this? I apply that principle, inclusion, exclusion. I say, remove the multiples of p, remove the multiples of q, but then what? Maybe there's some in common. If there's some in common, I need to add back the intersection. That's what this principle is saying. If you remove that and that, you put, need to put back the intersection. So let's do this calculation. How many reminders are in ZPQ total? If n is 15, 3 times 5, how many reminders are there in ZPQ? I think they pick you reminders. In Z10, there are 10 remainders. In Z20, there are 20 remainders. How many multiples of P are here? If you count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to Q minus 1, how many counts are those? <coughs> Q. How many multiples of P are in here? 0, 1, 2, up to P minus 1. How many? P. And how many things are in common? Is it any remainder that's a multiple of P and Q? Zero. This set is just a set of zero. So one. It turns out this is actually P minus one times Q minus one. Is that true? Mm -hmm. P times Q, PQ. Minus one times Q, minus Q. Minus one times P, minus P. And minus one times minus one. So for RSA, we can compute phi of n p minus 1 times q minus 1 using inclusion exclusion principle. I'll see you tomorrow and Thursday. Can I get that q back? Who has the q? Can I get my Q back? So only one person put it back? So far? I think I figured out the base. We'll get more cubes at the recitation tomorrow.